Once I got it. Şimdi YouTube'a aktarıyorum hocam. Tamam. Ve şimdi konuşmacıları alıyorum. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, representation of violence in literature, culture, and arts conference. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege uh, to host Professor Andrew Knight. Uh, we're starting right from the start with animals and animal rights, uh, animal welfare issues. Mm, conventionally, uh, it would come much later in a conference program. <laughs> uh, but now we start uh, right from the right thing. Was Jack the Ripper a slaughterman, human animal, human animal violence, and the world's most infamous serial killer is uh, the title of the talk, uh, Professor Andrew Knight's talk. Um, if you like, let me share with you uh, the short bio, a really short bio of this prolific scholar. Uh, Professor Knight is originally from Australia and ever since helping launch Australia's campaign against the live sheep trade to the Middle East in the early 1990s, he has tried to advocate on behalf of animals. For nearly a decade prior to 2012, he practiced veterinary medicine mostly around London. In 2013-2014, uh, he directed the Clinical Skills Laboratory and taught animal ethics, welfare, veterinary practice management, and surgical and medical skills at one of the world's largest veterinary schools in the Caribbean. He is now professor of animal welfare and ethics and founding director of the University of Winchester Center for Animal Welfare, adjunct professor in the School of Environment and Science at Griffith University, Queensland, European and um, EBVS European and RECVS veterinary specialist in animal welfare science, ethics and law, American and New Zealand veterinary specialist in animal welfare, Fellow of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons and Principal Fellow of Advanced HE, Higher Education. He has around 150 academic and 80 popular publications, an extensive series of YouTube videos. I'm a fan of them now. On plant based, uh, based companion animal diets, climate change, and livestock sector invasive animal research, educational animal use, humane clinical and surgical skills training, and other animal welfare issues. issues. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Knight, for uh, giving us and emphasizing this term, animal welfare, and extending the limits of the word welfare. And we are all ears uh, to hear your uh, argument uh, that communities with slaughterhouses are more likely to experience uh, the most uh, violent of crimes. You're all ears. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, very kind introduction. And um, I always, well, we say within the veterinary world that it's amazing what you can do with a veterinary degree. Um, that's true. We can go to many places, but I never thought I'd be ending up speaking at a conference on uh, representations of violence in literature and the arts. Um, and indeed, I never thought I'd be uh, discovering so much about uh, this disturbing case of Jack the Ripper, the world's most famous uh, serial killer. So, um, but there you go. It's amazing what you can do with a veterinary degree, I think. Um, actually, this represents a good example of uh, interdisciplinary uh, collaboration because I collaborated with a historian on this project and we bring in perspectives from animal welfare and history and literature, or ling linguistics, I should say, uh, sociology and so on. But the story starts, however, with this uh, lovely young lady who is my, my wife, 
and she is i'm afraid not as innocent as she appears to be she's got a little bit of a dark side in that uh, for my birthday many years ago she uh, arranged a mystery birthday treat for me and the mystery was that i had to turn up um, at a train station in east london in whitechapel on a wednesday afternoon at seven o'clock and i had no idea what i was uh, turning up for but I arrived on the footpath outside this train station and I found about 30 other people also there on the footpath, apparently waiting for something. And pretty soon the something was revealed. It was revealed that I was going on a uh, Jack the Ripper tour of East London. <clears throat> and we spent the next two hours uh, touring the locations uh, where the world's most famous serial killer uh, sadly murdered his victims uh, in East London. And the tour guide showed us a number of old uh, grainy black and white photographs of crime scenes, um, actually. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just uh, trying to get my presentation back yet. I will be sharing some pictures uh, with you of some of the things uh, that I saw. And when there are particularly horrible pictures, I'll try to pop up a little warning for anyone that doesn't want to see um, pictures of, of murdered uh, victims and things like that. Um, now, <clears throat> Jack the Ripper uh, sadly killed um, five of these ladies in 1888 in East London um, over a 10 week period. And there were two things about the case that made him uh, particularly notorious. One was the um, astounding brutality of the murders. All of these uh, women had their throats slashed uh, pretty much from ear to ear, uh, their abdomens open, and in a number of cases, um, they had organs stolen uh, from inside them and their bodies were mutilated. So very, very violent. Um, and the second issue was that there seemed to be a complete inability of the police to catch him. Um, a local vigilante committee was set up in East London at the time. Uh, the media was fascinated by this case, society was captivated by it, uh, and East London descended into a climate of fear. This uh, was became so famous that um, it triggered uh, copycat murderers. Uh, there were four other murders that were believed to occur uh, the following year, not, not attributed to Jack the Ripper. There were many false letters received by the authorities claiming to be from Jack the Ripper. Um, some killers since then have said that they're inspired by Jack the Ripper. And there are more than 100 theories that have been published as to the, the identity of Jack the Ripper and, and the profession of Jack the Ripper. And these range from the credible to the quite bizarre, actually. Um, last time I checked quite recently, there seem to be two new books about Jack the Ripper being published every year, even though we are more than 100 years uh, past uh, the time of the murders that he committed. So some of these theories are, are quite um, astounding. And one of them, for example, uh, theorises that a member of the British royal family was roaming the streets of East, East London at night in a carriage complete with a top hat and a cane, and he would descend from his carriage, disappear into the mist, commit murders, and then return to uh, his palace thereafter. Slightly more credible uh, was a theory that based on inconclusive DNA evidence uh, from swabs taken from some of the letters received by authorities claiming to be from Jack the Ripper, um, these were analysed by a professor of molecular um, and forensic diagnostics in Australia some years ago, and he concluded that Jack might have actually been a Jill. He might have been a woman. Um, however, this also seems to be quite implausible because um, Jack successfully overpowered all of these women, uh, managed to, to kill them uh, in densely populated areas close to many other people uh, with barely making a sound. So it's thought that Jack probably possessed considerable physical strength. <clears throat> so, um, one thing was notable, however, um, and it was this. On several of his victims, he seemed to be particularly good at uh, anatomical dissection and the rapid location removal of specific organs. Most of his victims had organs stolen from them. Um, a good example, I think, is number four, uh, Catherine Eddowes, 
Her body was found uh, in a corner of a square in London called Mitre Square, East London, one of the places that I visited on this tour. Uh, there was a police constable, police constable uh, Watkins, who traversed through Mitre Square after midnight. He was doing his patrols and there were a lot of police patrols in East London at this time because the police were desperately trying to catch Jack the Ripper. So he passed through this square uh, twice, only 14 minutes apart. And during that 14 minute period, Jack the Ripper somehow managed to uh, coerce Catherine Eddowes into a, a darkened corner of this square. He managed to render her unconscious, cut her throat, uh, remove her clothing, make a major incision into her abdomen, and then go into her abdomen and steal her uterus and her left kidney, and then disappear into the night. Now, he did all this in just 14 minutes, despite the fact that he was working at ground level, not up on a dissecting table, and he was doing it under conditions of very poor light, not under proper dissecting lights. So beginners can't do that. When we started dissecting uh, animal cadavers in anatomy, when I was a student in veterinary school, we would be given uh, the project of dissecting a part of a, a greyhound that was uh, donated from the greyhound racing industry because once they are no longer racing fast enough to be profitable, um, they are usually uh, killed or um, some are rehomed and some are donated to veterinary schools as well for teaching anatomy. So we were given a greyhound cadaver and our project uh, for a particular week would be to dissect a, a, a forelimb or a hind limb or the chest or the abdomen or whatever. And um, a group of students, so three students typically would take at least three hours to dissect one of these regions and it takes a long time, it's not easy to do. In particular, in this case, um, if you go into the abdomen, the first thing you hear is a massive intestines. And it's quite difficult to find the rest of the organs, particularly the left kidney, which is at the back of the abdomen, hidden underneath a lot of fat and the stomach and other abdominal organs. And yet somehow Jack the Ripper managed to do all of this in just 14 minutes at ground level without any tables, without any adequate lighting. So he wasn't a beginner. <clears throat> The examining pathologist um, of um, Edo's body said the murder had to have been committed by a person who'd been one of these things, uh, a hunter, butcher, slaughterman, or a surgeon or a, a surgical student. And of course, this uh, struck my interest um, when I was uh, on this tour because um, it wasn't so long since I'd gone through my own surgical training and I was a veterinary surgeon. And I found it uh, absolutely horrifying that um, I could have been potentially a member of a profession um, somehow related to this deviant ancestral colleague who had been committing these murders. But as I went around on this tour, I started spotting things which didn't make sense with um, <clears throat> the training or the technique used by anyone trained in surgery. And I didn't think that um, these facts were known. The tour guide seemed to have no understanding of the things that I was seeing. I'm going to um, sh show you uh, one of the, the bodies now um, and talk about um, the differences in surgical technique. And I, I was first alerted to this by looking at the body of the final victim. Unfortunately, this poor lady had been uh, eviscerated. Her uh, intestines were splayed all over her body. The organs were spread around about the room in which she had been murdered. So incredibly uh, violent and horrible form of uh, killing. Um, <clears throat> but I, I noticed that on this old black and white photograph that I was seeing, there was a cut on her leg, which didn't look like any normal surgical approach. When you are approaching, um, for example, the knee joint or the femur, because there's been a fracture and you need to access these parts of the body, you come in uh, through specific surgical approaches, certain surgical cuts. What I was seeing in this photo didn't look like those. It looked more like a, a butchering cut. Now, I'm going to show you the, the body of uh, victim, <laughs> excuse me, victim number four. So this poor lady, Catherine Eddowes, this is the photograph of her body uh, taken from the mortuary after her wounds were uh, sewed up. And this is the uh, diagram um, provided by the pathologist back in the 1880s of the incisions on her body. 
And what I firstly want to do, I'm going to run you through a, a sequence of information that I hope will establish that um, Jack was not uh, a surgeon or surgically trained. Um, the first thing I want to do is direct you to this, this normal looking incision into the abdomen of a surgery patient on the right hand side. And you'll see that there's a major incision on the abdomen. And once the incision has been made, this, the skin tends to spring apart and it springs apart because the skin is normally under tension. And when you cut the skin, it's like cutting the surface of a balloon or, or something, it springs apart. Now, it springs apart so much that it's, it's kind of impossible um, to even um, place a suture, a needle through the skin edges to uh, try to close the wound unless you grab the skin edge with a forceps and stretch it out to recreate some of that original tension. If you don't do that, the skin edge is, is very loose and it's difficult to pass a needle through it. It's also difficult to make a stab incision. If you look at the uh, diagram by the pathologist of the, the murder victim on the left-hand side, if you look at the bottom, you'll see um, the rectangular square. And if you look closely, you can see there are a, are a couple of small incisions that look like stab incisions made by a knife. And these small incisions are very close together and they are parallel and they're very close to the edge of the major wound in the abdomen. Now, it wouldn't have been possible actually uh, to, to make that stab incision if the skin edge had already been apart, if the skin had already been loose. So I think um, those stab incisions must have been made when the skin had all of its tension before the main wound had been created. So because of that, I think it's reasonable to conclude that the third incision was then used to create the main wound, it, it was extended. I think he put a knife in those original two locations and then wasn't able to extend the wound from there. And the third time he put a knife in, uh, he, he thought he wasn't hitting underlying bone and he then proceeded to extend uh, the knife in the direction one, two and three uh, in the, to create the major opening into the abdomen. Now, this is interesting because that's opposite to the direction that surgeons use. Those of us who've gone through surgical training uh, start at the umbilicus or even higher up in the region of the breastbone, and we extend our knife in the other direction. But this victim seems to have had stab incisions made in the rectangle in the region of the groin, which then uh, were used to generate the main incision. So starting from the groin, heading the other direction. That's not consistent with surgical approaches, but it is consistent with the uh, technique used to open bodies in abattoirs. When animals are stunned unconscious in an abattoir, the next thing that happens, if, if they're a large animal like a, a cow or a sheep um, or a pig or a goat, is that they are shackled. The hind legs are, are um, attached to chains and they're strung up so that the head is down towards the floor. What happens then is that the throat is, is slashed open from ear to ear, uh, the same way that these murder victims were killed. And what that does, and I'm sorry that this is horrible to talk about, what it does is it causes the blood to run out downwards uh, because of gravity. And so the blood drains out of the body, which, which is what you want if you're preparing a carcass for consumption. Next, what happens is that the abdomen is, is opened up and it's opened up by starting at the groin and roughly and quickly opening the abdomen so that all the intestines can be removed so they don't contaminate the carcass, which is meant for human consumption. So the direction of this uh, opening into the abdomen is the same direction that's normally used to open animals in slaughterhouses, and it's opposite to that which is normally used in uh, those who are trained in surgery, whether it's uh, veterinary surgery or human surgery. That's the first point to make. The second point to make is that those who are trained in surgery are uh, trained um, carefully to stick to the central line. And you can see on the anatomical diagram on the right hand side, there's this thing called the linear alba, or that means white line in Latin. And it's formed by the fibrous capsules which surround the muscles coming together in the middle and forming a tough fibrous band. And if you cut through this tough fibrous band, 
firstly, there are no blood vessels running through that gland, so you don't get bleeding, which makes it difficult to then see your surgical field. I even now recall a nightmarish situation uh, some, some years ago where I accidentally uh, went into the muscle because I, I, I deviated slightly off this band and I had a lot of bleeding making it difficult to see the surgical field. And you address that, you, you stop the bleeding in various ways. But we are trained as surgeons to stick very closely to this linear alba. The second reason we do it is that when you are closing the wound afterwards, if you put sutures through this or needles through this linear alba, um, they, the, the stitches, the sutures will hold very well. Whereas if you put them into the muscle on either side, the muscle is soft tissue and the sutures tend to pull out. They tend to pull through the muscle and come out. So you don't want that. So because of these reasons, we're trained in surgery to stick to this linear alba very, very strictly. But what we're seeing on the left-hand side is somebody who's deviating so substantially from the linear alba, the dashed line in the middle, that it exceeds what you would expect from anybody trained in surgery, even when working under conditions of poor lighting and even under stress. So that's another thing that makes me think this is probably not an incision that was made by somebody trained in surgery. <clears throat> so that, that was my initial thoughts when I saw that incision. But um, I'm not an expert in uh, extracting organs from uh, bodies. So I went to my uh, librarians at my university and said, do you have any textbooks um, that would give me information about the approaches, the surgical approaches, uh, if I wanted to remove organs from an abdomen? And the poor librarians at my university, we are a humanities university. We don't have a medical school. We now have a faculty of health and well-being, and we are bringing on various allied health professions, but we started off as a humanities university. And of course, the poor, poor librarians didn't have any surgical textbooks, but they were very skilled. They managed to reach out through their, their vast network to other libraries, and very quickly, they found me these wonderful textbooks about how to uh, approach and remove organs from abdomens. So I went through those, and there was nothing to to make me think that my theory was wrong. But I thought, how were people taught surgery in the 1880s in London? And I went back to the librarians and said, ah, can you get me a book from the 1880s? And they, they to their great credit, they, they actually succeeded uh, in finding me some textbooks on how to do surgery in the 1880s. These do not look like any modern surgery textbooks. They're more than a thousand pages long. The organization of them is very difficult. They're, they're hard reading, but I went through them. There was nothing to uh, contradict my theory. But I thought if you go and publish a theory like this in an academic journal, unfortunately the world is full of very clever people, particularly in criminology, and I'm not a criminologist, somebody's gonna come back as a critic and they're gonna say, but what about veterinary surgery? What about a veterinary surgery text? So I went back to my librarians again and said, this is amazing, thank you, but can you find me a veterinary surgery text from the 1880s? And sure enough, they did it again. So uh, full credit to our librarians at the University of Winchester for their um, amazing efforts. But anyway, I checked all of these texts and none of them uh, had anything to make me think that this theory was wrong. So coming, in, coming back to the uh, comment of the pathologist who looked at the body, he said the murder could have been convicted by somebody who'd been a hunter, butcher or a slaughterman. So that's where I, I started. I had these ideas when I um, did this mystery tour organized by my wife. And then things went dormant, things went quiet for several years until I met this lady. And the wonderful thing about um, going from say veterinary practice where I had been working into an interesting university with humanities faculties is that there are these wonderful seminars and symposia. People come along and give talks on really interesting topics that you're not exposed to in the veterinary world, philosophy, religion, history, criminology, anthropology, and so on. And this wonderful lady came uh, to the university one day from Oxford Brooks and gave a, um, <clears throat> gave a symposium, a seminar on, on her area of expertise, which was crime in Victorian London. I'm going to show you one of the horrible pictures that she put up during her presentation. So she was talking about a murder victim who had been killed by drowning. And she put up these pictures of the uh, pieces of lung that were taken from the murder victim. 
And in her presentation, she said, well, apparently some of this uh, lung change is consistent with drowning, but I don't understand how, how that is different from a normal lung. So afterwards, I thought this is my opportunity to go and talk to this wonderful lady. Afterwards, I went and spoke to her and I explained to her that, you know, how, how, how the uh, uh, abnormal lung differed and why drowning would have caused those changes. And, you know, the way that you do at a conference, you network with each other, you talk about bits of uh, rotting body parts from murder victims and you bond together. Um, maybe you haven't all been through quite that experience, but nevertheless, we bonded together over this rotting lung and pretty soon I was telling her all about my theory about Jack the Ripper. And we started working together on this case. And the great thing about uh, Dr. Watson was that she was able to bring in uh, a lot of historical and sociological information about East London in the 1880s. So in East London at that time, there were many slaughterhouses in the local area in which the murders occurred. And you can see this, this case was reported uh, all over the media uh, worldwide at the time. You can see the Times there commenting that animals are slaughtered daily in the midst of the area. Butchers with their bloodstains are seen everywhere. Sites are around which tend to brutalise ignorant natures. <clears throat> and this happened because there was a very large population of East London at the time. Um, and we didn't have the benefits of modern uh, industrial scale slaughtering with trucks and transportation networks and refrigerators, which allow animal slaughtering to be done out of town. So this very large growing population in East London, it was densely populated, uh, wanted meat. So animals had to be brought into where the people lived. And because there were no refrigerators, they had to be killed the night before they would be consumed. So a lot of these slaughterhouses actually were small scale slaughterhouses operating throughout the night. People would come in in the morning, buy the meat from the freshly killed animals and then consume that the same day. And there was an awful lot of this going on in, um, <clears throat> in the region in which Jack the Ripper was operating. Indeed, the neighbouring borough was the centre of the live meat market in London. You can see vast numbers of animals were being killed and sold every day and every year in the local area. Consider also uh, the first victim, uh, Polly Nichols or Mary Ann Nichols. She was dis discovered by a police constable on the morning of the 31st of August 1888 at uh, 3.40 in the morning uh, in a doorway um, very close, in fact about 150 feet away from a horse slaughter slaughterhouse. The first people to arrive um, after the body were discovered were two men who worked at a slaughterhouse opposite. As uh, one of the ripperologists has said in his book about uh, Jack the Ripper, uh, these slaughterhouse workers were well practiced in the arts of cutting throats. As I've explained, it's, it's uh, normally performed uh, on slaughtered animals, including today as a way to remove the blood from the body. Uh, they legitimately only carried knives. They probably worked and lived in the local area. Um, they would have blended in perfectly with the local color and character of the streets. Odell goes on to say this, it doesn't take much imagination to visualize them killing their human victims, escaping to the blood soaked sanctuary of the abattoir where he worked. What an ideal place to conceal the murder weapon and the organs stolen from the bodies. On top of that, <clears throat> there's the murderer seemed to have an intimate knowledge of local geography. Um, Catherine Eddowes' body uh, was found in the corner of Mitre Square in East London um, and Jack the Ripper appears to have uh, left the square um, through an alleyway and we know this because he scrawled a message on a doorway in that alleyway um, and we think it's uh, from Jack the Ripper because he also left a piece of uh, blood-stained uh, skirt which was taken from the murder victim, passed through that alleyway um, beyond the alleyway, there's a street, and in the street is, was a hand basin, uh, uh, one of the many public fountains in the area where uh, he probably washed the blood off his hands. And the thing about this basin is it's not visible from the street, it's set back from the street. So uh, if you lived and worked in the area, you knew that it was there, but if you were just passing through, you wouldn't have seen it. 
So it's theorized that he probably took this route deliberately in order to wash his hands and he must have uh, known the local geography. Next, let's look at the, uh, some of the sociological factors in this area. And it was a depressed area, a bit like a slum in which very large numbers of people lived and worked. Um, there was a lot of violence you know, going on in the streets. And you can see one of the commentators here saying the only wonder is that his operations were so restricted. There was no lack of ready victims available. Uh, there was a lot of prostitution, uh, a lot of uh, people who were uh, drunken uh, in the streets at night. Um, now, there were many uh, letters um, that were received by the authorities claiming to be from Jack the Ripper. And some of the sociological elements um, are relevant to this. A lot of those letters were probably from copycats and uh, not from Jack the Ripper. But this letter in particular uh, is believed to be from Jack the Ripper. And the reason for this is because this is the only letter that was accompanied by an organ. It was accompanied by a left kidney. The left kidney was examined by a pathologist who concluded that it must have been taken from a woman about 45 years old, Catherine Eddowes, who was victim number four, who had her left kidney stolen, was aged 46. The kidney must have been removed in the previous uh, three weeks. Catherine had been killed just two weeks ago. Uh, the kidney had uh, one inch of the artery attached to it, and another two inches were left in the body found with the murder victim, the artery is three inches long. The other kidney that was still in the body, the right hand kidney, had signs of disease, uh, severe Bright's disease, uh, known today as glomerulonephritis. It's an inflammation of the filtration units in the kidney caused by, among other things, alcoholism. And Catherine Eddowes, sadly, was an alcoholic. The severe disease on the kidney still in the body matched the severe disease found on the kidney that accompanied this letter. So for all of those reasons, it's almost certain that this letter is authentic and it was actually supplied by Jack the Ripper. Let's have a look at what it says. And this is what it says. I'm going to let you read this. And it was addressed to Mr. Lusk, the head of the vigilante committee at the time. And this is my uh, nod to linguistics by uh, talking about this now. So <clears throat> there's two things about this uh, letter that are very interesting. One is the language that's used. Um, it is consistent with the low socioeconomic status, the low educational status of many of the people living and working in Whitechapel at the time of the murders, certainly within the slaughtering industry. And in particular, if you look at the spelling of the word kidney up there, um, it's hard to sort of emphasize um, to anyone that hasn't been through medical training, how deeply ingrained it is in us to correctly spell uh, words like kidney. So either this person had not been through any degree of medical training or else they possessed a degree of imagination that um, uh, in my experience is rare amongst veterinary medical students. So, I think it's unlikely that this was written by a surgeon or someone who'd been through surgical training. The second thing is, let's talk about what he was actually doing there. Now, before I went to uh, university, I was I did a, a number of uh, low, low skilled, low paid uh, jobs. One of those was um, I worked in a it's like an abattoir for fruit and vegetables. It was a fruit and vegetable um, factory and and farm farmers market. So I worked in the back and we chopped and cut and wrapped fruit and vegetables all day long. And one of my colleagues um, would regularly steal bits of cauliflower. She seemed to love cauliflower for some reason. Uh, other bits that were regularly chopped off and eaten were um, pineapple, uh, pears, uh, bananas, uh, all seemed to be popular. So we were young workers, we were fairly uh, well fed, we were reasonably well paid compared to the people back in East London in the 1880s, and we had a social security system to support us. So we were not at all desperate. Back in East London, 
people would have been uh, worse paid. They had no social security system. Poverty was rife. Things would have been much more uh, serious in terms of survival. So if we uh, regularly uh, stole and ate bits of fruit and vegetables during the production line, I think it was probably reasonable to conclude that it was not uncommon that people working in abattoirs might have regularly uh, stolen, taken home, cooked and eaten uh, body parts from the animals that they were cutting up and processing as well. Now, for somebody that was accustomed to doing that on a regular basis, I think it would have been a much smaller step to take home and cook and eat a body part from a murder victim than it would have been for somebody who was working, for example, a, a, as a clerk. Let's have a look at the environments of slaughterhouses back in the 1880s. And you can see uh, the environment very, very well described here in the Birmingham Daily Post. Firstly, they talk about poleaxing uh, the animals. Animals today uh, are usually stunned unconscious prior to slaughter, unless they are undergoing religious uh, slaughtering. They're usually stunned unconscious via uh, an electric shock or via a captive bolt pistol. That's where the animal walks into a box in which it's narrowly confined so it can't move very much. Uh, a pistol is held up to its head and a bolt uh, shoots into the, the brain and retracts back into the, the gun so it can be used again. Or they can be put into uh, gondolas and rotated down into a pit in the ground, just a bit like a merry go round, a, a Ferris wheel. Um, and the pit is filled with carbon dioxide or other gases, so the animals asphyx asphyxiate to death. And that, that's a common way of stunning and killing uh, pigs, actually. So all of these are horrible. Uh, they're they're um, very cruel in that the animals are in a, a foreign environment. Uh, they're stressed. They see all sorts of things that may frighten them, strange uh, sights, sounds, smells. If the equipment fails, as it does in a small percentage of cases, uh, stunning may not work the first time and animals may need to be repeatedly shot with captive bolt pistols and endure uh, extreme pain. So that's the modern situation. Um, back in the 1880s, uh, the animals did not have the benefits of these modern procedures. Instead, there was no electricity, there was no captive bolt pistols, there were no carbon dioxide pits in the ground. People used pole axes. Animals were brought into the slaughtering area. They were not necessarily restrained very well. A pole axe is like a, an, a blunt axe, essentially. It's a, it's a piece of metal on the end of a pole. So men would... Uh, do their best to aim and hopefully strike the animal in the correct location in a single blow and it would be stunned unconscious or killed. If they failed, they would have to do it repeatedly until the outcome was achieved. This was hard physical work, so the men were half naked because they were sweating and they were brawny. Um, this this um, obviously uh, helped them to become muscular. So this is an accurate description of uh, slaughtering at the time. This is a very brutal environment to be working in uh, for the animals and also for the people working in those environments. We can see a description of the effects of this brutalization on the local society. The animals are daily slaughtered there. The butchers with blood slains are familiar among the street passengers, sites are common which tend to brutalize ignorant natures. This is um, in the, written in the Times at, at, at the time. There were calls for slaughtering to be done outside of town uh, for the sake of uh, public morals and uh, potentially uh, public health as well. And indeed, that is what has now occurred. Now that we do have uh, trucks and we've got road transportation networks, we've got industrialization of machinery and animal slaughtering processes, and we've got refrigeration, it's been possible to shift all of this away from the locations in which people lived. And the result today is that we've now got these giant factories that don't just uh, kill tens of animals uh, in a, a night, or 100 animals, they might kill thousands or tens of thousands of animals. In one sense, the methods used are more humane. We do now have electricity and captive bolt stunners, which work most of the time. They certainly don't work all of the time. On the other hand, things are somehow more impersonal today and more dehumanizing and desensitizing. 
Um, there's a good description by a sociologist of the experience of modern slaughterhouse workers. I'm going to let you have a read of this so you can get an idea of what it's like today. So this is one of the most difficult working environments uh, amongst all sorts of jobs that people can work in. Uh, people will try to numb the boredom through uh, listening to music on headsets. Uh, it's physically hard, it's relatively exhausting. Uh, it's dangerous. Um, there are knives uh, being used all over the place and the rates of injuries for the workers is higher than in most other professions. Uh, people can also pick up diseases from the animals as well. Uh, it's low paid, um, so there's a high turnover of staff because of the tough conditions. Uh, the training and is, is not necessarily very good. Now, what does this do to the people working in these environments? Well, uh, sociologist Professor Erica Cudworth uh, conducted a study of London slaughterhouse workers. She found that verbal abuse of animals and electric shocks to hurry them along was, was common. And that's understandable if you consider that these uh, workers are not, um, uh, are not being paid so much by the hour, but more by the numbers of animals that they're able to process through the slaughterhouses. And we're talking about hundreds or thousands of animals per day. Now, these animals are coming into environments with which they're not familiar. They're leaving their familiar herds. They've been on a truck journey commonly for a long period of time. Uh, they're being mixed with strange animals. There's all sorts of strange sights, sounds, smells, traumatic uh, uh, images, and so on. So they're fearful and they m often do balk. They are reluctant to move forwards. This slows down the line. It slows down production. These poor workers are exhausted commonly, they're frustrated, they're tired, they're not happy to be there in the first place. So it's not surprising, unfortunately, that sometimes they do use these electric goads and they may hit the animals and abuse them to try to get them to move forward. <clears throat> Cudworth said that according to those who teach slaughtering at Smithfield Market, the largest meat market in London, it takes a certain kind of person to slaughter, one who's got to have some disregard for the lives of animals and must be callous. And this makes sense, of course, if you're in this role and you are empathetic toward the animals, you uh, understand and appreciate and sympathize with the fear that these animals are experiencing and the stress and the, the pain and the suffering that they're enduring, you couldn't possibly do your job. And that would be uh, a big enough concern today when salaries are poor, other job opportunities for unskilled workers are not very good. But back in East London in the 1880s, where job opportunities were even fewer, salaries were worse, and there was no social security system, having that kind of empathy toward animals would have been an even bigger threat to economic survival. <clears throat> The effects of working in these environments, the people that work in them can't be uh, overly empathetic toward animals and going through this killing of thousands upon thousands of animals desensitizes them to violence further still. This has been documented very well by Sinclair in his book, The Jungle, describing uh, the culture uh, surrounding the Chicago slaughterhouses in the year 1900. And you can see his description here. He said the police officer has to be quick. After the people work all day in the slaughterhouse, they come out and there may be fights at two o'clock in the morning. If they get out of hand, like a forest fire, that may, might mean all of the police reserves need to be called. Best thing to do is crack every fighting head you can see before there are so many you can't crack any of them. There is but scant account kept of cracked heads. For men who have to crack the heads of animals all day seem to get into the habit and to practice on their friends and even on their families between times. And we know that sadly, as well as uh, personal injuries, um, slaughterhouse workers are at particularly high risk of um, domestic violence within their families. <clears throat> Recently, sociologists have started to actually study rates of serious and violent crimes in communities in which slaughterhouses are situated. And there have been at least two major studies. 
Um, the first one you can see is a study of more than 500 US counties, finding that the communities in which slaughterhouses are situated have greatly increased rates of the most violent crimes, including rapes and sex offences. Now, these authors also studied several other industries involving hard physical labour, dangerous working conditions, poor pay, uh, low levels of training, uh, high levels of immigration into the uh, working community and people leaving uh, the community. Uh, but none of these other industries actually had high rates of violent crimes. The only one that had high rates of very serious and violent crimes was uh, animal slaughtering. Similarly, in the last two decades, there have been a series of studies demonstrating links between uh, the commission of uh, cruelty and abuse toward animals and uh, the commission of uh, violence on people in later life. You can see the studies here. First one of 28 sexual murderers, many serial killers, uh, a surprisingly high proportion had committed animal cruelty uh, earlier. And you can see the quote from the uh, authors down there, cruelty toward animals might predispose toward violence against humans later in life and might also predict the most extreme forms of violence. Here's another study of 90 offenders in a Floridian maximum security prison. Violent offenders, the majority, 56% of them, committed acts of animal cruelty as children compared to 20% for the other offenders. Here's another one, 354 cases of serial murder. 21% of these had engaged in animal cruelty and there were many others. Um, again, with a veterinary degree, it's surprising where your degree can take you. And I never thought I'd be trawling through descriptions of the life histories of serial killers. But sure enough, I found myself doing that uh, during the investigation of this case. And it was so common to see that people who committed uh, animal abuse previously had somehow graduated on to uh, committing uh, acts of violence on people. So that's led in the literature to this uh, theory that um, early commission of violence on animals provides these opportunities to learn firsthand about the techniques and tools used to commit violence, to practice and to desensitize toward the consequences of this behavior. So violence towards animals is now considered a, a red flag by the FBI, by uh, social workers, psychologists, uh, signaling that others around that person may be at risk, whether they are uh, women, children, uh, elderly people within the household. So, Given those sociological insights and the other insights that we've had from surgical technique, from the history of the area and so on, was Jack the Ripper a slaughterman? We think that uh, he probably was. We know there were many slaughterhouses in East London at that time operating during the night. Uh, people were socioeconomically depressed. Um, which uh, affected their education levels uh, and the language they would likely have used on their letters. We know that the person committing these murders can't possibly have been a beginner. He must have had a lot of experience opening abdomens and taking organs, but uh, the characteristics of that wound strongly suggest that he can't have had any kind of surgical training. He was much more likely to have been uh, somebody like a hunter, a butcher or a slaughterman. I've spoken about the linguistic evidence, the misspelling of the word kidney and the other uh, signs of uh, lack of education at that time. And we know uh, that um, people that work in slaughterhouses uh, are basically damaged, um, those who are killing many animals uh, per day, per week, per year, thousands upon thousands. Uh, this desensitizes them to violence. People from these communities become much more likely to uh, commit violent crimes uh, in their local areas. And we know that the conditions back in East London without modern um, stunning techniques prior to slaughter were particularly brutal. So it's uh, entirely likely actually that uh, someone um, doing those things on a regular basis would have been desensitized to uh, committing violence on people. We know the techniques used to kill these poor ladies, the slashing of the throat and the ways in which the abdomen were open were consistent with uh, the way in which animals were killed and still are killed in abattoirs today. So there have been more than 100 theories as to who Jack the uh, Ripper might have been, the, the profession that um, he might have come from. We feel that we have uh, arguably the most credible theory here because we've managed to bring in all these different forms of evidence 
uh, and we think that Jack the Ripper was very much likely to be a slaughter slaughterhouse worker. Have things changed very much today? Um, sadly, the conditions for slaughterhouse workers today is not as, as much better as you might think uh, compared to the 1880s East, East London. Gail Eisnitz um, conducted um, an, an investigative um, project uh, for a year in which she embedded herself within that community and she described her experiences within this book, uh, Slaughterhouse. And uh, the um, conditions for the workers uh, in, in these slaughterhouses are very poor, uh, they're dangerous, they're physically dangerous, uh, they're mind-numbingly boring, desensitising uh, and very, very harsh. So um, things are not much better for the workers today, unfortunately. What are the impacts of um, these environments on workers today? Are they affecting the animals that go through those environments? British animal advocacy organisation Animal Aid has put hidden cameras in 12 randomly chosen British slaughterhouses in uh, the last decade or so. They've found that evidence of cruelty and lawbreaking uh, occurred in 11 out of 12. Animals were kicked, slapped, stabbed, um, picked up by fleeces and ears, thrown around, improperly stunned and killed, including by throat cutting when still conscious, beaten, burned with cigarettes and so on. So there is wholesale violence uh, that is being inflicted on animals today. It's a common occurrence, unfortunately, even in modern slaughterhouses today. It's been suggested that the uh, adding of uh, these closed circuit television cameras to slaughterhouses uh, would provide a solution because people would not engage in abusive acts if CCTV uh, is uh, on operation when, when animals are being killed. And so they have now been installed in most British slaughterhouses. However, there's a problem. Uh, the footage is not available to people other than the slaughterhouse owner who has a financial interest in making sure this footage uh, is not more widely viewed. Even the official veterinarians who are officially responsible for safeguarding meat quality and standards in the slaughterhouse are often refused access to it. So the British Veterinary Association said this, it's unacceptable that their slaughterhouses are not willing to share this footage with the official vets and certainly not with any others. We're lobbying for it to be mandatory in all slaughterhouses and for legislation to ensure that it's readily available. So yes, there is CCTV. Has it fixed things very much? Not necessarily. So what are the implications of all of this? Um, well, it does uh, provide, I think, some important implications for our reliance on industrial scale animal killing today in the modern world. Until recently, we didn't know very much about the sociological risks of this sort of wide scale repetitive socially sanctioned violence. But we now do know that this um, unfortunately has effects on the people working in those industries and there are risks to the people around them, particularly vulnerable people such as these groups here. Modern systems of animal slaughter are of course giant mechanized industrial killing operations. Violence has become uh, systematized and um, industrialized. This uh, clearly affects the animals going through these environments. Uh, they are still subjected to all sorts of stresses. It's a fearful environment. Uh, they don't receive uh, veterinary care when it's warranted uh, and so on. It clearly has effects on the workers and I think we haven't appreciated that enough until these sociological studies have started to be published. It clearly affects the surrounding communities as well. So. I would argue that it may once have been necessary to kill other sentient creatures in order for us to survive as, as humans, but these excuses no longer have any merit today. And it's clearly time to end our destructive social dependence on industrial scale animal slaughter. If anyone is interested in reading our academic uh, paper uh, and more details about our theory, we published it uh, recently in this journal there. And an easier way to find it is on my own website, uh, andrewknight.info, under articles there. You can easily find it there as well. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the wonderful people who um, put me on this most unexpected pathway. Uh, vets never do anything like this normally. Uh, my lovely wife, who was responsible for uh, sending me on that mystery Jack the Ripper tour, 
uh, a number of years ago and my very talented colleague uh, Dr Watson, the historian of uh, crime in Victorian England, who provided the historical and sociological uh, insights and access to those crucial pathology diagrams of the murder victim. I'm not sure how much that contributes to art and literature, um, but nevertheless, I hope you found that interesting and uh, I would like to take any questions uh, if anyone has any. Thank you very much, Professor Knight, for this mind-opening, shocking, uh, at times disturbing uh, talk, pro provoking talk. Thank you very much. and. We see how related all these different forms of violence are, seemingly uh, different forms of violence and cruelty are. Thanks for making us see this, understand this. And it seems that poverty was a form of violence because all these workers had to- Yes, there, know, there has be recently been this recognition that these are linked. And so there are things like the link coalition and link groups that have been established in places like the US, recognizing that when people are subjected to domestic violence, uh, we might be talking about women, children, elderly people, very often this will be linked to violence uh, committed upon pets in the household or threats of violence towards pets and that violence uh, committed uh, upon animals in general uh, is, is a red flag, a warning sign that uh, people may also be at risk and indeed that's what we saw in the large-scale sociological studies demonstrating that where slaughterhouses exist there's a lot more serious crime uh, going on. So yes, these things are very much linked. And as I said, this is an interdisciplinary study, brings together animal welfare, surgery, linguistics, uh, history. Um, Definitely. I never thought I'd be doing something like this, but here I am. <laughs> yeah, it must be very difficult for these uh, reperologists. Uh, it's even hard to listen uh, and, and be exposed to those images, cruel images, and must be very difficult for the reperologists to, to pursue uh, in a resilient fashion. Well, the floor is open for uh, questions. Maybe I can uh, read from uh, the chat box if they're not, uh, they won't be available through mic. Uh, yes, the floor is open for questions, comment, contributions to this great talk, the great Kickstarter of the conference. You know that there's, uh, we'll have a full two day uh, with papers on human animal bodies, animal violence, ecophobia, uh, along with honor killings, gendered violence, autoimmunity and violence, uh, domestic violence, violence in uh, different genres of literature, in theater, uh, in drama, in poetry, uh, in fiction, in sports, uh, as well as in sports, in cinema. So they're all related. And uh, we are super happy because Professor Knight started with uh, animal welfare. Uh, there's a question. Do you suggest the whole world should go for vegetarianism? Okay. Well, if, if the whole world was vegetarian, we certainly would not be killing animals on um, an industrial scale. In, the, in fact, we kill 70 billion uh, land animals each year around the world. I mean, compare that to the human population of around about 7 billion people. We kill a lot more marine animals, actually, uh, fish and other animals. There's about one to three trillion fish being killed each year. So, um, <clears throat> so you know, obviously, um, slaughterhouses would no longer need to exist. Uh, the impacts of uh, desensitizing workers to uh, acts of violence would no longer be felt within their own families and their wider communities. Um, the, let, let's think about the effects on, I suppose, the ecosystem. Uh, the majority of the world's animal biomass is now humans and farmed animals. We've 
we are very much creating currently the sixth mass extinction event since fossil records began. And these are events in which more than um, half of all the living species on the planet die. We're achieving that in something like three human lifetimes at the moment. Um, a major contributor to that, unfortunately, is um, large scale animal farming because the um, food system, agriculture in general, occupies around about half of the, the world's land-free ice, sorry, ice-free land mass, about half the world's ice-free land mass. About three quarters of that is given over to animal farming. And that may be pastures grazing animals themselves, or it may be clearing forests to grow feed crops to feed to animals. Mm. So if the world was vegetarian, we would be uh, using a whole lot less land, a whole lot less water, uh, rewilding, reforesting uh, the environment, producing a lot less greenhouse gases. Um, so, yeah, um, unfortunately, the current trajectory is, is bad for, for uh, domestic violence, violence in communities, uh, the health of the planet and the other species that uh, share the planet with us. So there is a strong case for asking people to change their current lifestyles, including to significantly reduce consumption of animal products. Thank you very much, Professor Knight. Uh, I have a question, uh, just out of uh, curiosity. Are there any uh, longitudinal studies uh, about the lives of these workers performing in slaughterhouses? Maybe they can be more convincing than all all we do in humanities, you know, this, well, uh, I mean, numbers, um, statistics. That's a, that's a really interesting question. It would be very interesting, I suppose, to uh, study workers at the beginning, uh, assess a range of uh, psychological characteristics, behavioural characteristics, their relationships, uh, their crime rates, and then to assess that a, a again uh, after working in the industry for a period of time. I, I'm not aware of such studies. It would be difficult to do them because this is such a um, a fluctuating industry. The workers tend to be poorly paid, um, poorly educated. The environments are very tough to work in. They're dangerous. They're incredibly boring. They're brutal. Um, so people usually don't stay long. There is a very high turnover mm -hmm. in these industries. So it would be difficult to actually track uh, mm -hmm. those people over time. But it would be very interesting if somebody mm -hmm. could do that and, and, you know, and see if there's an effect over time. Mm, maybe it will be more convincing too. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Knight. Yes, the floor is open for uh, questions, comments, contributions to this. Uh, I wonder if event. I've hor horrified all of your listeners so severely that everybody has has fled. Um, and I hope that that's not true. Uh, they, they to, we still have be... sixty six. <laughs> we started with seventy. <laughs> Uh, so it's, there's still okay. a good number. Yeah, that right. definitely, uh, you know, the images, uh, verbal, visual, they were terrorizing, shocking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, there are comments. Uh, there is one from Amber to everyone. Uh, this was an extremely interesting talk. Uh, she thanks you so much. So thank you very much. Uh... Yeah, it's, uh, I never, as I say, I never thought that uh, with a veterinary degree I'd be doing anything like this. Um, it was very interesting to, the more I looked, the more, more I, started, I, I, I started to discover. And this is a very was, rich field. Uh, I'm sorry, Professor Knight, uh, for interrupting, uh, but uh, the question has the second part. Will you be developing your article into a book? Uh, I think the question is, uh, will you write a book Mm. Yeah, uh, sadly, sadly, um, I, I won't, um, because this is not my primary area of research. My colleague, though, Dr. Catherine Watson from Oxford Books University, is producing a book about crime in Victorian England. And uh, this case, I'm sure, will feature significantly uh, in that book. We do have our article published, uh, as I mentioned, which uh, gives all the parts of this theory in a lot of detail uh, that's available fully open access freely on the internet um, and people as they can find it at my website mm -hmm. uh, i think dr uh, thank you very much professor knight and dr uh, has just raised her hand uh, please dr 
Hello, everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. He, I'm sorry. Hmm. Hello, Diar. Do you hear me correctly? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Firstly, my name is Diar. I am from one, and I have a big question for animals violence, actually. And the place uh, that I live right now has no official places for animals violence. And this is a big uh, problem, actually. And how can you help me? I'm sorry, the, the place where you are has no official place for animal violence, did you say? Right. Uh, do you mean do you mean a place to report animal violence? Yes, uh, there are lots of uh, animal violence actually, violence actually. Um, and and what what sort of violence do you mean that um, uh, animals are neglected or what are you talking about here? Actually, I want uh, to, this problem must be solved ASAP by some uh, official, by some official places. Yes, indeed. What, what kind of violence are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, abusing pets? Are we talking about farm animals? Are we talking about animals in abattoirs? What kind of violence are you Actually, talking about? Uh, I want to talk about some uh, farm animals in there. Okay. Yes. Um, it's common, I suppose, around the world that there are concerns about the way that farm animals are treated. Um, and it might be um, that the animals are neglected. They might not be receiving enough food or shelter. Sometimes yeah. animals are treated in ways that are abusive. Um, the animals, for example, that are transported to slaughterhouses may be beaten or pushed or struck with electric rods to make them move forward or abused in other ways. So these sorts of problems do occur. Um, sometimes these can be reported to authorities. Um, I uh, am, am also a New Zealand veterinary specialist in animal welfare. I spent some time in New Zealand recently and I regularly receive newsletters telling me that you know, various farmers have been reported uh, and fined uh, large amounts of money for um, neglecting hundreds or thousands of cattle or other animals. So sometimes these can be reported to authorities. Uh, very often it's difficult uh, to get authorities to take any action because uh, they are under-resourced. There are not enough of them. They don't have enough funding. They don't consider this a high enough priority. If you report animal abuse to police, for example, very often um, it's difficult to get police to take uh, action, even you know, in the United Kingdom, um, where there is not a threat to human life um, because the police also uh, do not have enough uh, police and not enough funding. It's not a high enough priority for, for police. So it, my, my bicycle was stolen recently. I reported this to police and I couldn't get them to do anything for this kind of reason. It's not seen as enough of a priority. There's not enough funding, not enough police. So um, sadly, um, here in the United Kingdom, fox hunting was banned in 2004. Fox hunting still continues uh, today illegally. A lot of that is reported to the police. Uh, it's difficult to get the police to take action because it's not seen as being important enough to police. It's not violence uh, being directly committed toward people. It's only violence toward animals. But things, things certainly are improving over the long course of history. If the authorities will not take action, you can try to report uh, things to the uh, Society for Protection uh, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in, in uh, your country uh, or other animal rights organisations or animal welfare organisations and see if there's anything they can do. Sometimes they can mount private prosecutions. More commonly, they will uh, provide a publicity campaign um, to alert people who are potentially buying products from these farms about the practices of abuse that are going on in the farms to try to stop people from, from buying those products and, and force change uh, through this means. This is the most common way that change is uh, brought in, I think, rather than through prosecutions by uh, authorities. Uh, this, this is a common occurrence, certainly in the United Kingdom, many other countries. 
Uh, I, I often get footage sent to me, YouTube video clips, which are taken by people who um, break into farms. So they trespass on farms. They go in in the middle of the night and they get undercover footage or they might be working in farms and they might have hidden cameras or there might be cameras that have been hidden in farms. And about every, honestly, about every couple of weeks, somebody sends me uh, some short footage taken from one of these facilities. And I see all sorts of violence uh, in the ways that animals are treated uh, and killed uh, in these farms. And often uh, this will end up on websites and be reported by uh, newspapers in the press. And sometimes there will be consequences. Farms will lose their accreditation, their uh, labelling uh, schemes that they participate in. They will lose accreditation in those. Uh, the authorities may be embarrassed that they have not taken any action and may be forced to take action. There may be prosecutions. Uh, major supermarket companies who purchase these products uh, will be embarrassed by this publicity that could harm their business and they will stop purchasing products from those farms. This can cause the farms to go out of business. People can lose their jobs. So uh, this is more commonly the way that things go rather than prosecutions by authorities. Um, so, you know, all of these are options and all of these are common occurrences around the world. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, just a contribution about the Turkish case. Uh, you know, there's this Ministry of Forest and Forestry and uh, they work in small circles, uh, Orman Koruma Müdürlüğü, uh, protection of forests. And they rely on local people uh, like you, Diyar. And uh, I have a family member working with these small circles. He needs to be remain incognito because they work in disguise. Uh, they find these people uh, who violate uh, laws for protection. Uh, they have a Facebook account, Instagram account, uh, Orman Koruma Müdürlüğü. Uh, you can reach them and report to them, uh, share photos, I hope uh, you won't see any, uh, of cruelty. Uh, and then uh, the teams mm. patrolling around come and try to help. I hope okay. this will be, uh, this will help. Thank you so much, Nisha. Uh, thank you, dear. Uh, Professor Knight, uh, there is one more question about uh, the demographic demographic facts of the Victorian uh, era. Uh, it says the from uh, Omar Faruk. It says the five women are sex workers in internet. So this means is there any different purposes of was there any different purpose for Jack to kill them? Uh, sure. It, so um, there are many theories about. Uh, why um, he just killed women and, in fact, prostitutes. Um, the area was uh, like a slum. There was a crowded area. There were many people in the streets, including throughout the night, drinking. In, there was prostitutes. There were people fighting. There were entertainments of various forms going on. Uh, it's thought that the prostitutes would have been easier to, to ask to come into a darkened corner of, of the square where Catherine Eddowes was killed, for example, number four, to um, ask them to come into private rooms where the fifth victim was killed. So potentially it's because it was easier to, to get access to and to kill prostitutes. Potentially, um, maybe Jack the Ripper uh, had a hatred of, of women. Maybe he was some kind of uh, serious misogynist. Um, and none of these are inconsistent with the idea that he might also have been a slaughterhouse worker. Uh, Professor Knight, there is one uh, contribution and by Amber, and then a very interesting question by Musi Yanar, if we can. Uh, Amber says there is a very interesting book about the victims entitled The Five, The Untold Lives of the Women Killed by Jack the Ripper by Helly Rubinhold, uh, published in 2019, which states that they were not all sex workers, but women in low socioeconomic uh, positions. Yep. Uh, so um, there were the five women that were killed by Jack the Ripper. There were four other women that were killed afterwards that were thought to be uh, committed by copycat murderers. Um, 
they were all in low socioeconomic positions. Um, some of them were part-time prostitutes. Uh, Catherine Eddowes, for example, was described as being a part-time prostitute. You know, they, they moved in and out of prostitution um, as they were forced into it by the uh, terrible circumstances in which they sometimes found themselves. Um, I suppose um, being in a low socioeconomic position to start with, with so, so little social support and so few other options um, un underlies a lot of the, the problems these women were experiencing. But as I said, um, they generally were engaging in prostitution. Well, there is one uh, question from Muhsin Yanar. Uh, why do you think we feel more uncomfortable with violence against animals and other species more in the 21st century, not in the previous centuries? You know, animals were sacrificed for celebration, for religious and cultural practices, even for show off, for power. Yeah, wow. I suppose there's there's two answers to this. One is that um, you could argue that we are more civilized than we used to be. Uh, it used to be the case, for example, that when we lived as hunter-gatherer societies, um, if you were an, an adult male, you had anywhere between a 20 and a 50% chance of being killed by violence from another adult male. Uh, nowadays, that kind of uh, violence rate is very rare. So it could be said that as time has passed, we have become a much more civilized society in which uh, acts of violence are much rarer. Some of these practices, religious uh, sac um, use of animals in religious celebrations, uh, and there are many of those around the world, animals being thrown off towers or killed in other horrible ways, um, are, are decreasing, um, are becoming outlawed in some regions. So we're becoming a more civilized society. Conversely, you could argue that we're not actually becoming a more civilized society. Um, we are now killing 70 billion uh, land animals and one to three, th three trillion fish, which is vastly in excess of uh, the numbers of animals that we ever used to kill. Um, but what we're doing today is we're shifting most of that killing uh, out of our, our own gardens, our own societies, and, and putting, it, putting it outside of town to places where we can't see it anymore. So it's not so much of our consciousness, our awareness. Um, and accordingly, um, we live in this, this artificial uh, world where we don't see uh, the violence, which is actually underpinning so much of our lifestyles. If we're talking about the um, animals that we, we consume, um, potentially the, the energy sources that, that we use and, and the, the ways in which various ecosystems might have been harmed uh, to obtain those, even the countries that we live in and the violence that might have been inflicted on indigenous societies in order for our ancestors to come to those countries in the first place. Now, I'm from Australia. Um, we uh, c unfortunately committed a lot of violence uh, to Aboriginal uh, people when the uh, white Europeans arrived in Australia um, uh, a couple of hundred years ago. So actually there's violence underpinning lots of aspects of our lives today, but we just don't see it feel it, hear it, smell it. It's not part of our uh, normal awareness the way that it used to be when we were hunter-gatherer societies. So on the one hand, we're less violent today. On the other hand, perhaps we're more violent, but the violence is more hidden. Um, and for either of these reasons, uh, we feel more uncomfortable with violence uh, toward animals today, I think, than we, we used to be. Yes. Probably the latter reason more than the former reason, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor Knight. And maybe we are more uncomfortable because we know that there are uh, many other uh, venues for food. Uh, there's food in plenty, so maybe there is no reason why we should uh, perform these acts of violence. Maybe that consciousness causes um, this discomfort because we know that we don't need it. Uh, yes, uh, it used to be the case that hunter-gatherer people, you know, would, would kill animals, but they often would uh, would um, profusely apologise to the animal, and they would explain to the animal that the need uh, to kill the animal to feed the, themselves and their family, and and so on. Whereas, uh, of course, um, none of it happens today. As, as you point out, there are so many alternatives available to us today. Maybe this also makes us more uncomfortable with consuming animal products uh, than we used to be when. Um, it was seen as being more necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, the field of alternatives is, is exploding for, for anyone that 
um, <clears throat> has looked at the the market uh, for vegan products lately, um, you would see a much bigger range of products than there used to be, uh, particularly in here in the United Kingdom, some other regions of the world as well. But it's no longer just plant-based products. We're now looking at a growing uh, animal tissue in laboratories. We're looking at in vitro meat. Uh, mm -hmm. We're looking at fungi. We're looking at yeast, um, seaweed. Um, so there's this whole alternative protein sector, which is starting to explode. Um, as a veterinarian, I'm very interested in the potential of this for pet food. Um, and that's actually the area of my current research. Um, so maybe the greater availability of alternatives today um, may also make us feel um, uncomfortable, you know, more uncomfortable in a sense than when it was seen as being more necessary uh, to kill animals. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Professor Knight. We have about 10 minutes uh, and two more questions, if you can. Uh, yeah, can, can dogs and cats go vegan uh, is, is one of the questions there. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, dogs, cats, humans, uh, earthworms, every species needs a specific set of nutrients and they're different for all different species. Um, what they don't need is ingredients. They don't need meat. They don't need cheese. They don't need Coca-Cola, any particular ingredient. What they need is nutrients. And providing that you supply all the nutrients that cats and dogs need from vegetable, mineral, and synthetic sources, there's no biological need for them to receive meat or anything else for that matter. So the question is, can you, can you do that? The answer is yes, you can. You can also get it wrong. You can formulate these diets wrongly, but if you formulate them correctly, then it's possible. Can you make the diet interesting enough that the animals will enjoy eating it and want to eat it? Yes, you can. We just published the biggest study of the behavior of cats and dogs eating different diets in uh, the journal PILOS1 recently. Um, and it's the largest study of its kind that's been done. And we found that the animals on the uh, vegan diets appeared to be just as happy with their food as the animals on conventional meat or raw meat diets. Um, so they can be just as happy. Uh, is, is the food as digestible as, as, as the other food? Will it get to the cells in the body as effectively? It appears that uh, it is and it will do so. So it's possible to do all this wrong, to formulate a diet incorrectly that's not nutritionally sound. But if you formulate it correctly to make sure all the nutrients are there, of course the cats and dogs can be vegan. They can be healthy and thrive. They may be less exposed to dietary hazards that are common in commercial meat-based diets. So there can be certain health benefits. The first large-scale study of vegan cats was published by Canadian researchers uh, very recently uh, in um, March of this year. And this is the first time this has been done. And they found that the vegan cats, um, <clears throat> they looked at, they looked at, uh, uh, close to 200 vegan cats, I think it was, and well over a thousand cats in total. They found that uh, the vegan cats had lower rates of gastrointestinal problems, liver disease and obesity, but in all other respects, uh, their health was the same as the meat eating cats. So there were a small number of health benefits. There were no health disadvantages for the vegan cats. So that's the only large scale study we have so far. I've done another one and we are doing the statistics for that at the moment and we will be publishing that within the coming few months as well. So you'll have uh, many followers from Turkey, as I understand, uh, the interest, the number of participants. There's yet one more question, maybe one last question. Do you think hidden violence justifies uh, violence uh, from Muhsin Yanar? Crikey, um, that's difficult. I don't know um, quite how to answer that one, to be honest. Um, the, the question, does violence justify violence, is perhaps a simpler question. Perhaps I could start with that. Um, you know, it's the, the, the knee-jerk response is to say that nothing justifies violence. Um, that's what we like to think. I think that's overly simplistic. I think the reality is that most of us would feel that 
in the case of self-defense, defense of our own lives or the lives of our um, close family members, for example, we would be willing to commit acts of violence and that that is morally justifiable. Could you then take that argument and talk about hidden violence? Would it justify violence? I guess you could argue the same in that case. You could argue that if somebody is uh, um, credibly threatening the survival of yourself, your immediate family members, um, most people would argue that there is a justification for violence if it is the only way to stop that from occurring. So that's a utilitarian uh, philosophical approach. It's one in which you say that anything is potentially justifiable, providing it does the most good. And it's different from, say, a deontological philosophical approach, which is adherence to a set of rules, um, regardless of the consequences. One rule might be you should never commit an act of violence, regardless of the consequences. So these are different ways to answer this question. Most people, I think, would take a utilitarian approach. They would say that if the situation was serious enough, if there was no credible alternative, then there would actually be justification for um, committing acts of violence. But there's a huge difference between doing something that's truly necessary to save your own life and something that is merely for convenience or for to satisfy a taste preference or to provide something like a new cosmetic product. There's a very big difference in saying that animals, for example, should be seriously harmed and killed for those things and it's truly necessary to protect uh, your life or the life of your loved ones. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Knight, for this uh, very important beginning uh, to the uh, discussions uh, today uh, and tomorrow. Uh, and I think we need to extend our thanks to another person, uh, Jasmina Debu if I'm correct in spelling, we should thank her uh, for ushering you into that uh, walk, Jack the Ripper walk, uh, which led to this fascinating research. Thank you and uh, your wife uh, for making this possible. Yes, yes, she, she had only given me that mystery, but if I was in prison, I would not be here talking to me today about this topic, so I will ask all my mistakes. Thank you very much, thank you very much, it's been great to talk to everyone, I find this fun, this is such a strange, strange and interesting case, I'd like to talk about it. I'm sorry, Professor Knight, but we have trouble hearing you, we have, maybe because of, I don't know, there's an echo, uh, can you hear me it's, now? Yeah, it, it's much okay. better now. Yeah, uh, my microphone gets tired after a long time, so sorry about that. Anyway, thank you very much. It's great to have a chance to talk about this. It's uh, one of the most interesting cases I've been involved in. Good luck for the rest of your conference, um, and thank you for inviting me. And we want to give you a big applause of thanks. Thank you. Thanks thank so you. much. Have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye then. Bye. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Goodbye. Uh, Barış Hocam, if you have anything to um, announce or... Uh, I just want to thank to Professor Andrew and to you, Hocam, for contributing to our conference. Pleasure. Yeah. So we'll have 30 minutes break, then four parallel sessions will start. See you there. See you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.